Dr. McDermott holds a Ph.D. from the University of Iowa and is one of the world's leading authorities on American theologian Jonathan Edwards. Jerry is the Anglican Professor of Divinity at Beeson Divinity School at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama. He has authored or edited 18 books. One of these, Theology of Jonathan Edwards, won a Christianity Today 2013 award for the top book in theology and ethics. And what he's going to say today is on our topic and says it will perhaps be somewhat controversial. I look forward to that. But I would be remiss if I did not point out that Jerry is also, I think, and many people think, one of the most important speakers and writers about the state of Israel, uh, the relationship of the Christian church to the state of Israel, and many things Middle East and in that arena. And I would just encourage you, don't think of him only as uh, a guy who does what he's going to talk about today, but also that as well. So uh, he will give a presentation, and we will have time for question and answer. So please, Jerry, come. Whoa. Thank you, Paul, very much. And thank you all for coming. Can public virtue be revived? Well, we've heard some great talks this morning and this afternoon. Uh, I, I think we know what must be done. The question is, can it be done? Uh, and how in the world it could all be done? Uh, or is this conference merely an academic exercise shuffling the lounge chairs on the deck of the Titanic? I think we risk that danger if we neglect a cultural connection that we've mentioned in passing today, but which is far more important than I think we might have realized. Now, now, now to be provocative, let me put it like this. Our republic is failing uh, because of a failure of masculinity. Not machoism, not chauvinism, but the classical and biblical conception of man as a servant leader. Soft churches have driven men away, and they have helped perpetuate a culture of feeling that undermines classical notions of manhood. The public virtues, the public virtues, and we're talking about public virtue at this conference, have diminished to the degree that masculinity has been attacked and ridiculed. Now more on all that in a bit. I want to start with America's greatest religious mind, Jonathan Edwards. The 73 volume Yale edition, uh, Yale critical edition of his works uh, suggests his stature as the greatest theologian of the Americas ever, and it's not just me saying that, and the most influential American philosopher before the 20th century. But his analysis of human psychology and his philosophy of history can help us, I think, think about how the Titanic can be saved from going down. Now, Edwards argued that there can be no ch major change in public virtue without a pervasive change in private virtue, and that private virtue will not change in, in any sort of lasting way without the renovation of the soul. But individual renovations of the soul are not enough if society is to be renewed. Societal, which means it's resulting political renewal, requires a cultural rebirth. And that comes from religious awakening. Now, Richard Newhouse recognized this decades ago when he observed that the root word from which culture comes is cult. This should, you know, religious cult. This should not surprise us. The founders recognized this connection. Religion is what drives all cultural change. Bad religion produces sick culture, and sick culture gives birth to a diseased polity with malignant conceptions of liberty and law. On the positive side, the founders were convinced that moral virtue was necessary to the health of the republic and that only a certain kind of religion, that which teaches duty, could produce that moral, and we would say, public virtue. 
As George Washington put it in his farewell address, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Let it simply be asked, where is the security for property, for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths, which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice? And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason, and experience, both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. We neglect the wisdom of Washington to our great peril if we think that getting the right ideas about religious and economic and legal liberty can sustain us without a cultural and therefore religious awakening. But how can we promote that religious and resulting cultural awakening? Here's where Edwards's philosophy of history can help us, I think. His seminal work, A History of the Work of Redemption, helped precipitate the Second Great Awakening in the antebellum period, which arguably spawned both abolitionism and the Civil War, which, for all of its carnage and degradation, showed the world and our own skeptics that we were willing to fight and die for what is right. In the history of the work of redemption, Edwards argued that the key to secular history is religious history, and that the engine that drives re, uh, um, religious history is the history of revival. God is in charge of history, directing it in ways that are mostly inscrutable to human minds. But in both scripture and in our own historical hindsight, we can see an all important pattern that God uses religious revival to direct the course of history. Look at the history of Israel, said Edwards. Its beginning and later history were driven by many and major revivals of religion in the family of Abraham. Whenever the patriarchs and then the kings of Israel fell away from the God of Israel, true religion was corrupted, public virtue rotted from the inside, and Israel was subjected to conquest and exile. But then there came, often enough, revivals of true religion. These led to renewals of the covenant. Think of the covenant renewals under Joshua, and then David, and then Josiah, and Hezekiah, and Ezra, and Nehemiah, which led in turn to societal renewal and returns from exile, both figurative and literal. In each case, religious renewal came before and was necessary to the renewal of moral and cultural virtue, which in turn led to public virtue. Now, Edwards argued that the rise of Christianity in the first century was a massive religious revival. It took a long time, but little by little, it changed the course of the secular Roman Empire. And by the fourth century, conquered that empire. Culture and politics were forever changed. That fourth century AD revolution, Constantine's triumph, was itself a massive religious revival. Sure, there were many who started going to church uh, because it was politically advantageous, yes, but there were many more whose souls and virtues were transformed because of a public church that was creating its own culture. There would have been no medieval Christendom, which with all of its faults, including especially persecution of Jews, nevertheless was the womb for nascent political and economic freedoms and produced artistic and philosophical and theological masterpieces that continue to dazzle our postmodern minds and enrich our own cultures. This medieval Christendom was built upon the foundation of the fourth century religious revival under Constantine and the Byzantine civilization to which that revival gave birth. 
Then, said Edwards, was the revival called the Reformation. Now, I probably don't need to tell this audience that there was both a Protestant and a Catholic Reformation, and that modern Europe was the result. Just as the Roman Empire and its Christianization shaped the world, so did the reformations of the 16th century. The pattern was repeated. Revival drives not just religious history, but secular history. Now, Edwards did not say, but even secular historians do say, that there would have been no American Revolution in the 1760s, that revolution of the mind, or the revolution of the 1770s, the revolution of bodies and blood, without the revolution of spirit in the 1740s called the Great Awakening. Before the Awakening, colonials thought of themselves as New Yorkers and Massachusetts men and Virginians. But after so many experienced the same awakening under the preaching of evangelists who went from colony to colony, men and women thought of themselves as Americans, united in a new and fundamental way with people of the other colonies, revival, drove history. Over on the other side of the pond, the English awakening, led by George Whitfield and John Wesley, not only brought new religious fervor to England, but changed its mores, its culture. By 1740, England, or let's say 1730, England was morally decadent and spiritually moribund. Drunkenness was rampant. Gambling was so pervasive that one historian called the England of that day a vast casino. Uh, um, infants were left exposed in the streets. 97% of babies born to women in the workhouses died before adolescence. The slave trade flourished. The awakening changed all that. England became known by the end of the century for temperance. Gambling was discredited. Infant mortality plummeted and a vast middle class emerged that was devoted to God and morality. Parliament stopped the slave trade in 1807. Pr arguably, that stoppage of the slave trade would have been impossible without the, the English awakening. Then there was this second great awakening, once more across the pond over here in America, that lasted from 1799 to the Civil War. Historians agree that this new religious revival produced scores of voluntary societies that, uh, that we heard about this afternoon. And that the most momentous among them was the abolitionist movement, apart from which there would have been no civil war. The vast majority of abolitionists came to the conviction that slavery was sin, and that they'd been convicted of that, not merely convinced, they would say, by the Holy Spirit who had come upon them in one of a myriad of Second Great Awakening religious meetings. Arguably, the civil rights movement in the 1960s was fueled by post-World War II, the post-World War II revival of religion in the 1950s. Now, it's well known that the most potent leaders, sorry, of the civil rights movement were religious leaders, rabbis, Christian theologians, and pastors. Martin Luther King always said the media kept getting him wrong. He was not a civil rights leader. That's what the media always wanted to call him. You're a, a civil rights leader. He said, no, I'm not a civil rights leader. I'm a pastor in the black church, and that's why I do what I do. He did what he did because of the gospel, he said, and, it's, and the gospel's promises for whole societies, not just individuals. So if at this conference, we are to have any chance of translating our ideas about liberty and democracy into real change for this republic, I would suggest we must think about how in the world religious revival comes about. That's what Edwards would say and, and what he did say. And before I say what Edwards taught about the how, let me make one other critical connection, if I may. And that's the connection which some folks here today, uh, you know, some of our speakers have mentioned, between public virtue and robust churches. Now, by, by robust, I mean the churches that are willing to challenge the dominant culture where feelings are supreme. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk the line that the founders drew between true religion, that which teaches duty, 
and not the supremacy of the self. The line between true religion and the morality which is necessary to support the American Republic. The problem is that all too many of the churches in America have become soft, emphasizing feelings more than doctrine, especially when orthodox doctrine conflicts with what is politically correct. This is one of the principal reasons why high proportions of men have dropped out of the churches. As a result, increasing numbers of their children are dropping out. Uh, you probably, I'm sure you've heard that the biggest sociological change in American religion in the last uh, 15 years has been the rise of the nuns. Those who don't claim any church or denomination to say I'm spiritual but not religious. The religion outside of the churches, and Bob there was talking about you know, secularism as a religion, has been teaching the supremacy of feelings and the supremacy of the self since the sexual revolution of the 1960s. And now that revolution has infiltrated the churches. Most men reject touchy-feely religion that's afraid to talk about the Bible's hard sayings. And their kids notice that dad has decided the church is not important. Many women hate that kind of religion too, don't get me wrong. But it's been the disappearance of fathers and men from the churches that has had massive impact on our culture. We used to think it was enough for mom to bring the kids to church, that enough of the kids would learn from mom. But there is startling new evidence that children follow the example of dad, not mom, when it comes to religion. In 1994, the Swiss National Census started including uh, questions about religion and church attendance, which means the results were incontrovertible because of the sample size, the entire population of Switzerland. Here are the results. When both mom and dad go to church, 90% of the children go to church as adults. When only mom goes, only 10% of the children attend church as adults. But when the father goes, and not mom, then 90% of the children go to church as adults. The percentage is the same as when the father and the mother go, 90% of the children church as adults. Bottom line, it's the father and not the mother who determines whether the next generation makes church a priority. This is all important for those of us who recognize the link between true religion, morality which teaches duty, and public virtue. As Anglican vicar Robbie Lowe has put it, you cannot feminize the church and keep the men. And you cannot keep the children if you don't keep the men. By feminized churches, he means churches that drive men away by preaching a soft gospel. Now, feminization is a good thing when we're talking about uh, the development of girls and the maturity of women. Men need feminine women, and so do the churches and society need feminine women. But when emasculated liturgy, gender-free Bibles, and fatherless flocks suggest to men that masculinity is a bad thing, most men don't want to go back to church. Somewhere deep inside, most men connect with a masculinity that sees its God-given duty to sacrifice for the greater good of the well-being of women and children, their survival of their nation, and the protection of truth. Now, of course, uh, um, women are also called to sacrifice for the good of family and church and society, but in different ways. For decades, the worlds of entertainment and university have mocked fathers and husbands. They've been, they've been portrayed as dumb and oppressive when they seek to lead. Men have been shamed for even imagining that the Apostle Paul might have been on to something when he said men are called to be fathers, that what it means to be a man is, is to be called to be a father, either biologically or by adoption or spiritually, a spiritual father. And they're also called to be heads of their homes, the Apostle Paul says, and that men are called to be leaders of the church. I, I would argue is what the Apostle Paul says. Most men resonate with that, but they're too afraid to say it. 
in this culture. Most men know, know that they're not supposed to lord it over their wives and children, that, it, that, that headship doesn't mean that, that male leaders are to serve in humility, and they're willing to serve strong female leaders in the state and at the office, but they resonate with Orthodox Jews and with Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and conservative Protestants who connect a godly masculinity with leadership in the home and sanctuary. Now for millennia, most cultures have agreed with what Thomas Aquinas taught back in the 13th century, that men are not being true men, but instead they're effeminate men, now this is Thomas Aquinas speaking, when they refuse to detach themselves from sensory pleasures to endure the pain of pursuing something greater than themselves. Now, 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 now that's in his Summa Theologica 2.2, question 138. Today, the sensory pleasures include food, sex, and video games. Men who reject chastity and pursue promiscuous sex, either with another body or virtually through porn, are therefore not true men. They fail to be truly masculine. If men close to Harvey Weinstein had been willing to rise to the challenge of true masculinity by foregoing self-interest, they would have openly challenged his exploitation of women years ago, and scores of women would have been saved from his cruelty. Now today, our culture views Orthodox Judaism and Christianity as morally offensive and downright dangerous. It's easy today, on the other hand, for Orthodox Jews and Christians to talk about racism and immigration and think that, that they're engaging the culture with their faith. But the cultural engagement that will make a difference for the future of Orthodoxy and our Republic is over marriage and sexuality today, I would argue, and other culturally offensive issues tomorrow. How many Orthodox are willing to defend the faith at those points and risk their privileges and careers? How many are willing to be like the Apostle Paul, that tough hombre who was willing to suffer beatings and stonings for the sake of truth? And we talked about truth this afternoon, uh, Hans Martin. The danger is that too few are willing. Huge numbers of evangelicals are following the path of, evan of, of the evangelicals here in America, the late 19th century, who decided that since doctrine is divisive, the social gospel was the way to engage their culture. It was the path of least resistance, and the result was what we call today liberal Protestantism, or bourgeois religion. But our republic needs political difference to remain healthy, and it takes the courage of conviction to sustain political difference. That conviction and the willingness to fight for it is at the heart of public virtue, I would argue. Since true religion is the womb that gives birth to the morality of conviction and duty, a revival of true religion is needed for a, re a revival of public virtue. So how do we get there? Uh, let me close by suggesting five critical steps on the road to that revival. Uh, number one, we need to reject that part of the sexual revolution that evangelicals and large numbers of even Catholics have accepted, at least in this country, the notion that sex need have nothing intrinsically to do with procreation, and therefore art artificial means of birth control are perfectly acceptable. When both Catholics and Protestants also accepted the myth of global overpopulation, they decided that they were free to decide for themselves about children and to reject the import of the Bible's first commandment to human beings, be fruitful and multiply. Rodney Stark showed us about 30 years ago now that the early church, the early Christian church grew not only because of conversion, but also because the early Christians and the Jews had far more babies than their pagan neighbors. We need to encourage, well actually we don't need to encourage Orthodox Christians, I think they already have a, well I know they already have a high birth rate, but, but we need to encourage Christians to take the first commandment seriously. For as Mormons have shown us, both church and society prosper when religiously serious parents 
have more children than the replacement rate, which is 2.1 per woman. Number two, we must catechize our children and adults. Synagogues and churches need to teach that Sabbath should include both worship and religious education. Properly catechized people are disproportionately engaged in the public sphere, square. And those religious voices are absolutely necessary to a healthy democracy. As Robert Wilkin has argued, it's more important that Christians build Christian culture than try to change non-Christian culture, finally, when you get right down to it. Unless we have strong and thick Christian culture, secular culture is going to do more to evangelize Christians than they can do to evangelize it. Number three, we, we must find other ways to provide higher education for our young. The American university and college system is intellectually corrupted. Many so-called Christian colleges are similarly corrupted because their professors were shaped intellectually by those corrupted universities, e e even though they sign uh, Christian faith statements. We should send more of our young to the, to, to, to the Hillsdales and the universities of Dallas and Yeshiva University. We should encourage more of our young to enter the trades, as uh, Bill was saying this morning, where they are free religiously and can support their large families. Four, some of us should take the Rusty Reno route of selective cultural engagement, willing to challenge the majority culture in an intellectually sophisticated way. But others will need to take Rod Dreher's Benedict option which does not eschew all civic engagement, but suggests a step back from uncritical immersion in the public square for the sake of strengthening the inner life of ourselves, our families, our churches and synagogues, and our little platoons, so that when we go back into the public square, we can do so as authentic Jews and Christians. That's what Orthodox Jews do already to remarkable public effect. Uh, number five, pray. Edwards taught that spiritual revival and cultural reformation come at God's decision, his sovereign decision, but in response to prayer, which God inspires. E Edwards called for concerts of prayer in which churches across the land agree to pray for national revival on the same day every month. He said that wide, widespread disgust and I think most of us are disgusted uh, by the state of the church and nation, are signs that the spirit is moving. So it's good to be disgusted. That's a Holy Spirit consciousness. I don't want to say feeling. <laughs> what Christians then need to do is to agree to pray in concert for revival. This is what Christians did after the American Revolution when American Christianity was at a low ebb, as Rodney Stark has also shown. <laughs> Revival broke out in 1799, and the rest is history. The Second Great Awakening changed America forever. Let us pray for a new awakening. Thank you. Well, it was provocative, but I liked it. Um, <laughs> let's do uh, time for question and answers. We've got uh, about 45 minutes, and so, Pardon? We don't have 45 minutes? I was told 5.30. Well, what, what did the officials say? Because I don't want to mess up live streaming or people that want to leave. 4.45 closing. 4.45 closing remarks? <laughs> well, I think we need to do at least 15 minutes. This, this sex is here just to sing with everybody. <laughs> 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 Let's do about 15 minutes uh, for anybody who doesn't want to ask a question. Oh, well, well. There's one here. No, we hold on. Hold on. Um, uh, first, that was very good, especially in light of our previous conversation. The one thing that 
I'm Seth Kaplan. I teach at the School Up the Road, the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Um, the one thing that you don't mention, which I think you probably would mention, and I, and I found it mostly lacking, is this problem of technology. The problem of the onslaught of media, mm -hmm. starting of course with television, and now I'm reading Facebook is gonna have messenger service for uh, under 13 year olds. I was in the newspaper yesterday or the day before. And um, um, w w how do we build defenses and how do we reclaim um, uh, uh, the space we want to reclaim when we are under such attack at every level by media? And the media is the education of the next generation. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the exact answer to that question, but I do know that uh, a lot of my uh, Orthodox Christian friends, and I imagine some Orthodox uh, Jewish folks, are talking about this and, and are coming up with their own private ways of doing this. Um, uh, I know some Anglicans who recommend to their flocks that 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 they, um, you know, cut off um, that that they control very carefully the input of uh, the internet into their home. Uh, I know a Christian theologian who tells his theology students. There's two things you have to do to, do, to uh, do theology well. One, you have to pray. You can't do good theology without prayer. And number two, you have to get rid of the Internet. But I, but I hear lots of conversations now amongst serious Christians, and, and, and like I say, I, my, my guess is the same thing is happening in the, uh, in the serious theological Jewish community, uh, trying to answer that question. So my question is a little bit more on a practical based on some of the things that you were saying. Um, given that, uh, as a Baptist, uh, given that um, <clears throat> much of uh, much of conservative evangelical uh, Christianity Americans have um, uh, bowed to uh, another authority other than the scriptures, namely feelings and experience and pragmatics, and they don't even realize it. It's just inherent in the preaching and the worship and the ministry. Um, how do you um, how do you combat that in the church in a respectful and loving and yet uh, firm way, without um, I don't know. Maybe it's impossible without uh, being completely ostracized. <laughs> well, um, I find that I, look. Uh, I'm an Anglican priest, and uh, I, I, I was teaching pastor uh, for 10 years in a Lutheran church. Um, I am teaching pastor in an Anglican church now. Uh, now, I'm a full-time professor, but, you know, part-time um, pastor in churches and have been for, for years and year, for years. Uh, we, we just talk about this thing all the time from the pulpit. And serious Christians nod, and they say yes, and we want to hear more of this. But it, um, because it's so massive, as I think you're suggesting, John, uh, one sermon won't do it. You've got to continually hammer away, you know, uh, line by line, uh, paragraph by paragraph, bit by bit, over the course of years. Uh, um, 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 because it's in the atmosphere, the supremacy of the self the supremacy of feelings over where a religion has been so internalized that it's all about what I feel rather than something outside of me. Now, we Jews and Christians, we believe that God is a God of revelation. He has come from outside of us to reveal himself to us through the history of Israel and Torah. For, uh, for Christians also, I mean, we agree with that, but but we say also through Jesus and the church. So God comes from outside of us, and, and in my tradition, um, um, through the liturgy and the sacraments, from outside of us. And this is so foreign to the modern Christian mind, which is all about God inside of me. Uh, 
which you could say is a Gnostic conception. So we, I mean, uh, uh, the, the pastors, the priests that I've worked with, we work on this all the time. God comes to us. God's a God of history. You know, you know, the God of Israel is a God of history who works in history outside of us. It doesn't matter what I think. You know, it doesn't matter what I feel. God is working in history despite me. And the question is, is whether I'm going to catch up to him. How you doing? I'm uh, Sean Riley. I uh, want to defend you real quick on the on the manliness point. Uh, I think if you look at the whole question of today has been on virtue. If you look at the etymology of virtue, it means manliness Here. from the Latin, right? Um, so I think it's important. And I and I, uh, piggybacking off of what you just said now, I think that uh, one of the ways to to reconnect uh, men to the church it is through the liturgy. And the reason why mm. that is is because uh, I was raised in a, in a non denominational mm. sort of a motivist. Uh, mm -hmm. Church. I'm now a Catholic. Why? Mm. Because uh, I, it, it, I, I experienced the way that I experienced church was um, necessarily a motivist. And if I didn't get that emotion, mm -hmm. I felt sort of bad about myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so uh, I but I realized in returning to liturgy that it's the sacraments work um, objectively. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter whether I feel it or not. I mean, hopefully mm -hmm. I do and I should and, uh, you know, so forth. Um, I should respond to it, of course. But not always, and the sacraments work mm -hmm. objectively uh, in mm -hmm. that sense. So I think liturgy and, and a return mm -hmm. to kind of some kind of sacramental mm -hmm. uh, view of the world can help to reconnect that. So that's my statement, but comments mm -hmm. would be welcome too. Well, yes, and, and I tell you, um, I, I've started talking about this, the, the problem of, of a lost masculinity and a lost sense of manhood. And um, whenever I speak on this, I get incredible response from men. Men have felt so beaten up in the last few decades by the culture, by, well, uh, by scholars. Uh, you know, it's, um, and, and uh, you know, you know, to have someone say that it's, that it's not bad to be masculine. It's not bad to think of yourself that God has called you to be a leader in your home. Now, that doesn't mean that you make all the decisions. It doesn't mean that you uh, dominate the home. Uh, it means you take spiritual leadership of your home. You pray for your wife and kids every day. You make sure your wife and kids get to, to uh, worship and education on the Sabbath. That's what, it means to be, th that's what it means to be a spiritual leader. And so many men say, oh, wow, I never realized that. Whoa, yeah, I can do that. Ah, yeah. And men don't know how to be men. A and I think this is a pervasive cultural problem. You know, what kind of social pathologies do we have I in our society today from fatherless young men, fatherless young women? Uh, most of our social pathologies would plummet to almost insignificance if men stood up and became fathers, if men became true men. All right, one more, right here. Hi, uh, Michael Maybach, thanks, Jerry. <coughs> uh, excellent talk, thank you. My question is really the problem of equality. I think mm -hmm. part of what the attack on masculinity has been the equalization of the two sexes. For example, why, why is the prayer our father? You know, mm -hmm. gee, that, that's the beginning of inequality right there. So how do you, in the Tocquevillian you know, e age of equality, mm -hmm. how do we deal with this demand for equality when you're talking about uh, something different than that? You know, uh, certain things are equal, like equality before the law, and, and other things are very unequal. Men are fundamentally different from women. And I tell my, my students at the university, if, if that seems strange to you, then you're, you probably never live with the opposite sex. <laughs> you're probably not married. If you're married, you know that men are fundamentally different. So 
you know, I mean, the sexual revolution and particularly a radical kind of feminism has tried to persuade us that ma male-female differences are simply because of socialization, you know, since, uh, you know, simply acculturated. Uh, but I think, you know, as some of our speakers said, I um, uh, think of Hans um, uh, and Alexander, we need to take the long view. Things are starting to fail, big time. Uh, um, people are seeing, our, our, our generation is starting to see that the easy answers we've been getting from our university professors, from, a, and hey, I've been a college and a university professor for 30 years. Um, the easy answers that we've been getting from the sexual revolution fundamentally don't work. And I find that whereas five years ago, even talking about you know, you know, the need for more masculinity, the need for men to be men, would get me uh, called immediately a sexist, not so much anymore. And, and I see many, many women nodding their heads and say, you know, I wish my husband would get onto this. Uh, so we, we're, we, our, our culture is in such a state of fer uh, ferment and, and turmoil that I think we can be optimistic. You know, we talk about optimism and pessimism. We can be optimistic about the future as this cultural confusion uh, spreads and people see that what we've been told just is not working. And maybe males and females really are fundamentally different and, and maybe that does and should make a difference both in the home and in the synagogue and at church, and that's where things start, in, in, in the home and in the sanctuary. 